like that on the dot of eight o'clock, it's me, Matt Bailey, <coughs> Matt Bailey, excuse me, um, National Ambassador for Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, talking all things whiskey and having a chat with us, having a chat each night about some of the things going on in whiskey, some of the things worth discussing, some of the, some of the topics, some of the rants, some of the interesting things here and there happening at the society, happening in whiskey in general. And I really appreciate you tuning in and watching as I try and do this every single night. Andrew's going to do it sometimes as well. For those who have saw, saw Andrew's one a few, a couple of weeks ago, uh, yeah, almost, yeah, two, no, it's two weeks ago. Um, you know, he's, and that's great if he can, if he can jump in and do them as well, uh, even better. In fact, I'm going to be doing one with Andrew. I'm going to be doing a live with Andrew in the next uh, few days. And Muzzman, who just joined in, uh, we're going to get another book review in. We've got another uh, a book night. 45 Finn, Cal, Jerry, Muzzman, Johnny Edwards, Just Dramming. Thanks everyone for tuning in as always. Uh, oh, how I've missed this camera. I can't help but that's a bit sar sarcastic. Um, yes, we're, we're back to front again. We're sort of, you know, everything's reversed again. I'm sorry. Um, because I don't have any bottles really to show you, or maybe just the one. But today, tonight's more of a discussion, and I want to be able to see the comments a bit easier and, um, and be able to respond to them in real time rather than. Um, uh, well, actually, you do get a bit of a delay watching this. I know there is it's about a maybe 15 second or something, 10 second, 10 to 15 second delay. Um, it's almost like the old TV delays in, in, place, in case I had to beep out swear words and nudity, I guess. But uh, there won't be any swear words or any nudity. No, I have sworn on this channel before, um, but no nudity, sorry. Um, today, tonight, tonight I wanted to... Um, Tonight I wanted to <laughs> camera flipped again. <laughs> if that's your biggest concern, then that's that's not the bad thing to worry about. Yes, the camera's flipped again, but I'm gonna work out a I'm gonna try and work out a system where I can have this camera permanently around the right way, uh, so facing the right way around, flipped back. <coughs> flip, sorry, I don't know what that was. Um, flip back around, um, so that you can you're not gonna labels will be the right way around. But anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> Strip Bailey, yikes! Uh, Sally, Sam, uh, yeah, Muzzman, let's let's do a um, let's do another one. Let's just do another another night of reviewing. I can come to yours, you can come to mine. We can or you can tune in and do it do it live with me. I think it's better in person though. It's always better in person. Okay, tonight's subject that I wanted to touch on was the future of whiskey. Looking back, looking forward. And I wanted to hear what your thoughts were on the future of whiskey as we know it. And when I say whiskey, I mean the whole category. I'm talking like grain whiskey, I'm talking bourbon, I'm talking single malt scotch whiskey, I'm talking Australian whiskey, I'm talking all, all categories. We're looking at this holistically from a world scale uh, of uh, where and what, where the whiskey industry has been. We need to use that as a sort of a benchmark for what we're going to be talking about, which is where it's going. And where the future of that industry is, is in and and how how effective our predictions might end up being. Which so if you want to if you want to jump in and answer some questions, barley brains, Ali's whiskey, William, thank you all for joining. Um, so just you know if you've got some questions there that you want to, or any predictions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the first one out at you. So I think uh, one of the first my one of my first predictions about the next decade. Let's start with the next decade of of. Mature brick, good to see. You. Let's start with the first, the next decade. I reckon what we're gonna see. Uh, yeah, no, Cal's right. Cal's right. Before I start talking about all this stuff, I do need a dram. You're right. Haven't had one yet today, so uh, I'm gonna pull. Now the reason I'm pulling out, um, well, I've got the wrong sort of glass. I still got a society copper, but it's the wrong style. Uh, because we're talking about the future of whiskey. I'm going to imbibe on something that is truly from the past. Now, I told you the camera's around the wrong way again, but I'm going to have an Irish one, and this is from a distillery called 51.14, or known to us as Bushmills. Um, Bushmills have been in operation. I had to do my research on this recently, but I know they've been distilling since about 1608 or something like that. Um, so we're taking a step back in time with a lovely Irish drop to, to talk about the future of whiskey, and it's a lovely juicy oak and vanilla. Very, oh, lovely. How's the fruit on that? 16 year old, 16 year old single cask from Bushmills. Monarch Perth, happy birthday, Monarch Perth. Uh, it's getting floppier. Barley brains, mate, I tell you what, it's, it's because I just washed and conditioned it. Um, and you can, you can, don't, don't be all envious on me here now, mate. Look, come on. I know, I know beneath, I know that you've got this crew cut going on and you just want these long locks. I get it, I get it. It's okay. I'll let you touch my hair next time you see me, uh, Seamus. Um, Monarch Perth, yes, happy birthday. Um, so, 
Um, so, okay, so the the next decade, well, the next decade, I think the first the first prediction we're going to see what is the next decade. Um, uh, must have taken hours. You guys are the worst. Okay, okay. What's the next decade hold for the futures of whiskey? And I don't mean Scotch whiskey. I mean all whiskey types. I think one of my first predictions will be that in the next decade we're going to see quite a lot of good mature whiskey finally again. Uh, so if we look historically, we had sort of those that there was a bit of a, uh, a bust in 82, 83, 84, not great years for whiskey making. That means, is you know, that's why a lot of 30, 35 year old whiskey now is very expensive. I think that's going to level out a bit. I think we've seen the peak on, on the pricing of, of, of um, we're talking core range whiskey mostly here as well. I mean, I think we're going to see, um, you know, a lot more, I think we're going to see a lot more mature whiskey hitting the market. Um, and a lot of maturity of stock, especially in uh, developing nations of whiskey, uh, countries like Australia, countries like uh, America, countries like um, uh, England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland. Uh, we're going to see a lot more uh, maturity of stock starting to happen finally, which I think is really exciting. Now, my second prediction. Uh, I wrote this down. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, okay. So, I reckon the second thing we're going to see is a far wider gap between uh, traditional, like old school distilleries and the new world distilleries. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it will affect pricing and availability and access quite a bit, I think. So as new world whiskey distilleries, a lot of the new world ones start developing um, scale and start getting like heaps amount of scale coming out of their distilleries. They start looking at things like you know, they start pushing sort of anywhere from, you know, three to six to 12 to 20 million liters a year. Like we're starting to talk some serious quantity of spirit and we will start seeing that from some of the new world distilleries, um, especially in Australia, but even around the world. And I think that's really exciting. It means it's, that's gonna challenge how people approach things like cocktails, uh, whiskey culture in general. Um, I think it'll be less, it's less tied to sort of just nationalistic approach, but really just like a, an approach associated with uh, when and why and how people drink those spirits, which is great. Um, and that's happening in America already. That's already starting to happen in America, but we're going to see it happening here soon. And I think that's I think that's a really like crucial point that um, new world whiskey distillers will start challenging the traditional ones a bit more in the marketplace. However, what I think that means is the traditional whiskey distilleries and the big names that we already know and love, the McCallans. Uh, the Lafroigs, etc., of the world, I think will become in some ways even more um, will cover like like cover more ground in a smaller area. Now, what I mean by that is some of the world's best wines you can't buy. You have to be on a wait list on a secret list that's on a wait list with that winery, and you've got to be a member of that winery for for even ten years before you get access to certain wines in their cachet. I think we'll start to see a bit more of that happening in whiskey. Uh, for better or for worse. It's just how it will go, I think. And so we're already starting to see some distilleries experiment with that in their in their marketing and in their placement of spirit, which is what my my world is. It's 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 marketing and development and understanding uh, our membership, understanding the economics of whiskey is quite important to me. So having that sort of understanding that I think we're gonna see a bit more of that happening uh, where there's a differentiation, wide, a wider gap even between um, new world and old world distilleries. We're gonna grab some of these questions. Muzz says, as early as th as of early this year, bourbon can finish in other barrels as long as they detail the entire provenance on label. See, that's a huge change already. And for those who've been following the um, news with Scotch whiskey as well, uh, the Scotch Whiskey Association only just about two months ago opened up the um, the amount of the, the laws. The laws have been much more relaxed on cask use and 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 like ex cask use. You can now use ex. Oh, this is a discussion for a whole nother time, but you can use things like ex-Calvados barrels now and ex-Tequila barrels and um, ex-Rye casks and stuff like that for Scotch whiskey production. Um, oh, they already had ex-Rye, sorry. But you know, the, the, the amount of cask usage has widened quite a bit. And I had a joke with uh, our spirits manager in the UK saying, uh, uh, how long until we see a... Um, <laughs> I made a bet, how long until we, we see an ex-Tequila cask finished society single cask? And um, his response was, uh, I hope not soon, but 
Never say never now. Of course, the, the rules have been relaxed. It's, I think the first announcement was back in May or June that those laws were starting to be relaxed. And then it was just in September, I think, last month that they finally laid it all out. Uh, whiskey culture in Australia and India will be better and we're, because of stock standard. Um, yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, casks are currently the biggest point of difference that distilleries use. What do you think will be the next point of difference? Ah, really good question, Johnny. Okay, I'm going to answer that one now. I'll get into my third point. My, uh, so my, my, my first point was that I think we'll see a decade, the next decade will be more mature stocks. My second point was that I think we'll see a new old whiskey distilleries get much bigger and challenge old world, but that means they'll, they'll create a divide and someone will come in the middle and grab that. And that means that the, that'll change. However, Johnny asks, cast are currently the biggest point of difference that distilleries use. What do you think will be the next point of difference? Honestly, Johnny, um, if it was up to me, distilleries would focus far more, and you know this already, but distilleries would and should focus far more on their spirit quality and, and picking and researching yeast strains and barley strains and uh, varietals that are uh, far more uh, yield, uh, are far more focused on yield of flavor rather than yield of tonnage, uh, of literage, and so, and having, just being a bit more sort of considered in their approach of, of spirit quality. Now, some distilleries are already doing this, as you well know. Um, and uh, for those who don't know, Johnny Edwards works at Lark Distillery, and he's a distiller at Lark, and they do great spirit at Lark. In fact, Lark New Make is delicious stuff. Um, and I think that's, you can tell, you can tell an awful lot by the new make spirit of a distillery. So if you're ever, if you're ever, anyone here gets to do a distillery tour, if you, if you do distillery tours, um, the, it always ask if they, if they offer, I mean, if they offer, but you know, I said the other night, don't ask for special favors at distilleries, but I wouldn't feel too out of place asking if you're, if you're allowed to taste their new make, uh, because I think it's a really, it's like a window into the soul of the distillery. It's a window into the soul of how they make that spirit. Because there's so many factors that go into it, and the more that distillers and brewers, to that extent as well, take their time uh, understanding different yeasts and actually researching this stuff and having it, and that's why some distilleries are now hiring proper sort of chemists, if you like, sort of barley chemists to work on site and things like that. We're starting to set some of the bigger, bigger New World distilleries, not so much in Australia, but a little bit in the US, and, and I think that's really exciting. That's exciting times. And I think that's the next movement, Johnny, should be distilleries focusing more on, on, um, on spirit type, on their spirit quality. And the second thing, which is, this is like sort of part B of this, is actually focusing a little bit less on cask, if I'm being completely honest. Especially in Australia, and I don't wanna get a rant about this, and I have already written about this before on our website, but uh, distilleries often focus too much just on the cask to the point where the spirit quality is irrelevant almost. Uh, and I find that to be fascinatingly short-sighted. Um, so yeah, I'll, that's that's my answer to that. I mean, it's just really take take a bit more considered a time with the spirit, and um, and speak with spirit consultants, speak with barley consultant, speak with um, brewers, speak with growers, speak with people who uh, provide the ingredients for that, and it, and you can actually really formulate something through lots of trial and error normally. But not, most distillers don't want to do trial and error because that's expensive. Uh, question from Cal. Oh, also Sam. G'day, Tiggs. G'day, Tommy. G'day. Uh, Cal, do you think there'll be more experimenting with finishes in barrel like rum, ex, port, ex, bourbon, and we have already seen? They're still using different strains of wheat and corn. Okay. Um, well, there's already okay. So Cal, I think we'll see more experimentation happening with, with casks in the next foreseeable future. I don't see why not. Um, we see ex, port, ex, bourbon, ex, rum, etc. casks quite often through, you know, through usage. And I think now with the SWA laws relaxed on those types of casks even more, on the types of finishing and disclosing of finishing, I think it'll become even more popular in distilleries and brands will use that as a marketing point rather than as a, a defect, which is unfortunately has been some of the times where, um, it's not, that's not the reason why, but it's often to reinvigorate a cask will be, a cask will be finished on something else. But finishing is always, is, is, is often one of the best improvements to a spirit and can provide like a fourth dimension to it. Uh, and often it's often unfairly seen as um, uh, as just you know fixing a, a dud spirit, which is never the, almost never the case. It's it's unlikely, um, and that's right. Yeah, but no, there's just different types of wheat and corn and stuff happening. But that's it's very limited still so far, Cal. It's very limited. I mean, blue corn. You can name one distillery off the top of my head, which is Balcones, uh, that you know do blue corn spirit, and it's like 
Blue Corn's one of about what? I can't even. I don't even know. Like I don't know this. It's one. Uh, Blue Corn's like it's probably one of about eighty or ninety different corn varietals. And there's probably about eight or ten different types of blue corn alone. So, yeah, lots to go over there. Uh, prediction from Muzzman says, more scientific analysis will be done across the whole process to optimize more and more and reduce waste unnecessary cost. Very true. And there are some distilleries doing remarkable stuff with this muzz. That's not, that's, I'd say that's a very safe prediction as well. Uh, and I mean that in a nice way. It is, it's a very, it's, they, they absolutely will. More science will become involved in the actual making of spirit. And conversely, that I think there'll be mostly new world distilleries that do this. And it'll be old world distilleries that go, well, we still make everything by hand. And we still use the same barley strain we used in the 1900s. And we still use this yeast. And, and it's, it'll be, we do this the traditional old way approach to making whiskey. And there'll be the modern, this is made in a lab approach. If I was to provide two exact distilleries like that ex as, a, as an example tonight, There'd be the old school, this is how we've always done it, approach, which is kind of like the Brook Laddie kind of approach to making whiskey. Then there's the, this whiskey was grown in a test tube in a lab somewhere, Elsa Bay kind of whiskey. So one's a Lowland, one's an Isla whiskey. Two very different distilleries. Elsa Bay is almost not even, hmm. Elsa Bay almost isn't a distillery. It's, it's basically, a, it's a science project. It's, it's, um, it's something else. It's a, that's a discussion for another night, of course. Petrino 11, good to see you. Okay. Now, you've heard my two first predictions and I've answered a few questions in between here. Um, here's my third prediction, and this one is of the next sort of 10 to 15 years of, of, of whiskey worldwide. So my third prediction for the future of whiskey, is, which, is discussion, which is the discussion tonight, and I'm answering as many questions as you like. Um, my third prediction is, I think we're not gonna see a whiskey bust. We're not gonna see, you know, like a, everyone's waiting for the crash. Everyone's thinking, oh, there's gonna be a whiskey crash at some point, right? You know, it's like, and, uh, and I'm, I'm probably here to tell you that no, there probably isn't. Ooh, sorry, bump the chair. Um, there probably isn't going to be a, a whiskey crash anytime soon. Uh, however, there will be. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident in saying, and I'm not the only person who thinks this. Um, there's going to be a craft whiskey crash, and I think the abuse of the word craft, as I've said before in previous videos, and how craft is no longer it's a, almost a meaningless phrase in some ways, um, is kind of like that's worrying. And so therefore the message becomes diluted and not just the message, but also sort of the, how, how people, um, uh, you know, how and when people sort of understand that spirit and how it's educated and how they won't all be the same. Like, let me put it this way. There's thousands of distilleries operating in America, thousands. We must see maybe 12 in Australia. So if you take out Woodford, Beam, Jack, and um, give me the fourth one. Woodford, Beam, Jack, and uh, my brain's gone blank. Oh, Wild Turkey, sorry. If you take those four out, like really, you're left with, well, you're left with scraps. You're left with MGP and, uh, and a few others. So you go, well, what's the, uh, how is that, so, like if there's thousands of distilleries producing uh, whiskey in, in the United States now, they can't, all, they won't all have a point of difference and they won't all produce quality spirit either. So I think we're going to see a bit of a crash in craft whiskey, but I don't think it will affect the big, the mainstream uh, or you know established distillers. Let me answer a few questions in between. Uh, what about missing different strains of corn like um, blue and red, etc.? Will that ever happen? Or will it turn off new or occasion drinkers seeing as GMO corn or made in Lebanon and distillery? Cal, I think it's all in the way it's sold. I don't think consumers would actually have a problem with drinking GMO corn whiskey. To be honest, I think it's just it's um, genetic modifications in corn is already happening. I don't think it's going to be a problem if, that, if it's sort of a GMO whiskey even. I just, I think in the end, most people won't care. It's, it'll be the way it's packaged and the way it's, it's sold rather than the way it's sort of like, if, you, if they labeled it as GMO corn whiskey, I think I might have a struggle. But if they labeled it as uh, scientifically engineered spirit, it might be kind of cool. And that's what Elsa Bay does. They're you know, scientifically engineered sort of lowland spirit. I'm fascinated by that distillery. Um, a question from William. Why does the more from the 70s taste different to now? Do you think they'll change anything to make the old taste? Will, that's a really good question, and it's not just affecting Bamore. Uh, why does their all whiskey from the 70s, pretty much all whiskey from, the, from then, taste different to now? Now, there's a lot of reasons behind that from the wood, from the supply of casks, from air dried staves versus you know, heat dried staves, um, the rush uh, uh, and the, you know, the, the so even the soil that the trees come from, that the oak trees come from. There's so many reasons that will start from this level 
that, that come to where they are today and why they've changed. Um, often processes have sped up as demand has gone up, so fermentations have dropped down in time a little bit some here and there. Um, maturation changes. Types of casks used in the 70s were very, very different from how they are now. Um, they were still ex they were still ex bourbon barrels, of course, and ex sherry butts, but they were they were. But even then, the, the e bourbon producers now say they don't even know how to reproduce that. Jimmy, uh, Jimmy from um, no, it was it was uh, yeah no Jimmy Russell from uh, Wild Turkey was asked that very question at a tasting I was at, where people said, "How come old Wild Turkey tastes like all ruby and lovely and soft and delicious? Or like seventies and eighties Wild Turkey was delicious bourbon." But how come modern wild turkey tastes a bit hotter and peppy, more pepper sort of notes? And he said, well, we don't know. We, they, they don't know the, the exact answer. They've got theories as to why it's changed. So if their casks are changing, then the Scotch whiskey cask is going to change as well. But I think a lot of the it comes down to that, that sort of 70s and 80s uh, wide availability of great sherry casks. That was um, that's a whole other topic entirely. But it was sort of the availability of sherry butts was a much different proposition, or sorry, like actual sherry casks, not seasoned sherry casks as we see today. Uh, nothing wrong with seasoned sherry casks. They, if they do a great job, they do a great job. But they were just different then. I, ne I never subscribed to the belief that things were better back then. Uh, I always subscribed to the belief that things were different then. It, things change, tastes change. I think we're living in, in now in a golden era of great whiskey. And I think if we keep just going, oh, rose tinted glasses, it was all better back then. I'm not saying you're doing that, Will. I'm just saying it's like it's whole set of that sort of approach can often be a bit sort of like, oh, you know, we've all, ah, oh, I long for the good old days of whiskey. I think we're in the good old days of whiskey now. We're drinking some of the best whiskeys that are coming out now. And it's like, uh, and it's kind of, if you blink and you'll miss it sometimes, but it's always getting better as well. Um, 70th cast don't exist anymore. A lot of sherry and port been consumed back then. Yeah, Sam, sorry, I was just saying that. I hadn't scrolled up to your comment yet. Yeah, different different um, consumption of those of those fortifieds worldwide, which has changed dramatically over the years, and the availability and supply of those casks from those bodegas has changed dramatically. Uh, modern malts are modified anyway. Exactly, yes, they are. Um, Cocktail Code joined. Uh, here we go. Adrian joined. Morky Moo joined. Okay. Yeah. So, um, since following your environment meeting, do you think? Um, the water, the water supply ever, event, uh, ever changed product or taste? Uh, if it does, if the water supply was to ever be the contributing factor to the flavor changing of a spirit, then that would be the last factor that you'd need to think about. Let me just make that clear. It's the barley and the yeast that is the most important ingredients for flavor. Whereas the water is an important ingredient as well, it's in, especially in the production and manufacture, it's not in the flavor. There was a scientific study, Andrew quoted it the other day, there was a scientific study showing that water contributed less than 3% of the final flavor of that of a whiskey. And I'd agree with that. That was a, that was a scientific study proving that. And you go, um, it actually doesn't matter if I agree or not, doesn't it? It's like, well, I agree. I agree with proven science. Great. Um, uh, yeah, so... Um, yeah, Mars right, that's a really good point here. Whiskies are a time capsule of their time and place. Neither good nor bad, just a snapshot of the times. I couldn't have said it better myself. It's like a whiskey is a snapshot of time of if you, and you, you get a bottle and you open it up and it's like, whether you open it now, you open it in 30 years. You'll be able to taste it and go, that was a snapshot of how whiskey was made when it was distilled. So it'd be kind of cool to own a 30 year old whiskey for 30 years. So in like the year, you know, 2050, you could open a bottle that was distilled in 1987 or something. Um, I don't think I'll have the um, the patience to hold on to some of my 30-year-old whiskeys that long. I don't have too many 30-year-old whiskeys or 40-year-old whiskeys. I've got a few old old bottlings here and there, but uh, I'm 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 more of a fan of um of um generally young uh, generally younger spirit. I, I like my I love my sort of just lovely space side. My my ideal whiskey is almost like a refill. Uh, a refilled 12 to 15 year old uh, car strength, like Longmorn or something. Like, it's just a, a, like a lovely space side. I'd love to hear what your, almost like your, you know, your your ideal whiskey is for those in the chat. Uh, Dram and Draw joined. Good to see you. Uh, Malia Barry. Ha ha, I disagree, Matt. Johnny, uh, we're going to have to agree to disagree on that one. Hmm. Scott Fitzsimmons joined. Um, Scott's doing a live each week as well. He's doing a weekly. I'm, I'm the idiot who can who um, convinced myself to do daily. So uh, jokes on me. 
But um, Scotty is doing a live stream after this at 9 p.m. Uh, if you want to follow him, I think it's either through him or the Oak Barrel. Scotty, there's your shout out. So don't tell, don't say I haven't, don't do anything for you. Um, yeah, Johnny, look, yeah, it does. Okay, it plays a huge part, but it's the third, it's the third most important ingredient. Uh, I'm happy to, I'm happy to prove him wrong. I mean, I'm not going to argue with a distiller because you really do know what you're doing. I just, it's just one of those, like. Um, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about this another time, over a dram or two, I think, yeah. Um, uh, that's my goal, 35 whiskey to be held for 10 years. Mate, 10 years isn't, isn't will fly by, you're, you're young, you'll be fine. Uh, if you're already 60, then 10 years feels like a, maybe a long time to wait. You might want to enjoy it now, or 70. Um, yes, uh, Morky Moo. Yes, m Scotch whiskey marketing, you know what, this was going to be a subject for a another night. Andrew's just written a great piece on this, on Whiskey and Wisdom. Uh, our seller master, he wrote a great article on, you know, Scotch whiskey marketing and how it's changed. But um, if, was, if I was just to dial back a bit further from where he started, I reckon Scotch whiskey marketing in general, whiskey marketing has a lot to answer for. I reckon they've made a lot of errors along the way and they've, and they've never bothered to correct them. And I know that's almost nitpicking a little bit, but, uh, you know, from, you know, the fashionable catalogs of, you know, uh, you know, semi-naked women pouring bourbons and stuff, it's like, this is all just terrible, just terrible advertising. And it's just sort of like, we've, we've come a long way, but some distilleries, <laughs> which I won't name right now, are still doing um, very terrible marketing and I should say terrible advertising and that only just sort of uh, upsets people with the brand rather than encourages them to try it. Anyway, um, so Morky, yeah, exactly. That, there's, that's, I hope that answers your question is, you know, the uh, I might I'm, I'm having to be a bit disproven on the three percent thing, but I did. I'll find that study and I'll link it up in in um in our uh, in our profile or something. We'll put it in the Facebook group. Speaking of which, just that's my own little plug tonight. If you are not in our Facebook group, uh, we have a great group with lots of good discussion in there. Always feel free to ask questions in there as well. That's what it's about. So it's just SMWS Australia uh, on Facebook. Really good discussion in there. Always a good place to have a chat. Um, Water chemistry will always have its effects on fermentation, so some could argue there's some difference there. Also, cutting the whiskey back to 46%, for example, would require a fair amount of water. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. Um, you know, it's, I think, I mean, I, I often add water. You've, you've seen me on the channel here, and I've lost my water jug again somewhere, so I won't add any to this one. It shouldn't need it, it's in its mid-50s already, 56.2. Uh, it's a single cask Irish whiskey, lovely golden hue to that. Uh, lovely. Say, if a local distillery has plenty of Casa four in, uh, four in the water, a bit softer, if it had more ca Cal 2, sharpens flavours. Perhaps an experiment for another day. Sam, um, yeah, Cal, I just had my first sip. There you go. Took my time nosing that one. Um, Cal, um, sorry, Sam, uh, I would argue that you're correct in that I would say that the water source and like calcium levels and fluoride levels and everything and the water composition, I should say, um, play a much larger role in brewing and in, in finished beer. But when it comes to distillation, they have a lesser impact. There's so, the, the process of, of dis, distilling it, of, of essentially neutralizing it in many ways, um, has far less of an effect. Uh, it's still an effect. It's just not as much as what 90s whiskey marketing would have us believe. So, just to recap on tonight, because I've been talking non-stop, my three predictions for the next 10 to 15 years in whiskey. One, for those who have missed the video, sorry, I know some people are just tuning in now, Whiskey and Drinkies, Matt Music MW, I'm just, um, I'm just coming to the end of my half hour talking about things tonight. Uh, I, might, I might do a, like a mega session one day a week, like a, like a, like a proper like one or two hour and people can just tune in and I'll just have a few drams and I can talk for two hours straight. Don't worry. You can, you can probably tell that I can. So if you, if you wanted to, if you want to see a mega session, just let, let me know. Let me know if maybe one day a week could be like a, uh, like a one day a week could be like a mega sesh, like a, I don't know, like a Sunday night could be the Sunday night mega sesh or something like a two hour. I'd probably take Monday off then. I don't know. Like let's, let me know what you think of that. Um, yes, Johnny, we need to chat about this. Uh, send that email to me, Johnny. You've got my details. Come on. Okay, uh, then here's my three predictions for the next 10 years in whiskey production. Uh, whiskey, sorry, you know, overall, ready? And I'm, I'm gonna, um, 
<laughs> Mega Matt, the Mega Matt pod, the Mega Matt live Instagram. Okay, my three predictions were, in case you just missed them. One, we're going to see an explosion in mature stock. And that will be from all ranges of new and old world distilleries. And it'll be, and we'll see good experimentation and proper age statements and maybe even less and less no age statement product. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Um, so more, more, more mature stock will be coming onto market as people have been for the last 30 years planning for uh, this. Uh, second would be the expansion, but also divide. So the expansion of new world distilleries Expa- and expansion as we're already seeing of old world distilleries, but a divide in the middle. And I reckon we'll see that divide sooner rather than later in that uh, old world whiskies will become harder to get in some ways. And they'll become a bit like old school wineries where you've got to be on their mailing list for 10 years to even get a look in, to even be allowed to buy their wines. So that's my second prediction. We're going to see growth in both, but we'll see um, they'll, they'll change... Uh, It'll, it'll divide, drive a bit of a wedge. That's okay. That's okay. It just means that drinking patterns and people's um, uh, people's habits and people's uh, selection will change, which is fine. And the third, the third one, the third and final one was a bit of a sad one, but I think we're going to see a lot of little craft distilleries across Australia, across America, across Scotland, everywhere. Uh, you'll see a lot of copper for sale soon. You'll see a lot of uh, cheap stills and cheap fermenters and cheap casks coming into market because there's only so much room. And when you set, and you when you go from a market like America, which had uh, whatever it was, it was like 126 operating distilleries in 1999 or something. Uh, now they've got something like three and a half thousand, or maybe even more. Uh, it's like that's that's a subs- that's a not not a sustainable growth. And everyone wants to distill, everyone wants to create something interesting, and they're not all going to have something interesting. And the same in Australia. We've gone from whatever, uh, what was like, um, uh, some, Johnny, you might, you might know this one better, but it's kind of like, um, uh, we had something like, what was it, nine operating distilleries in Australia at one point, uh, and back in like 96, 99, somewhere around there. Uh, and now and now we're at what 220 distilleries I don't even know anymore again I can't keep track of them I know there's more than 100 there's more than 100 so I tell people that and it's like it's like how many distilleries are there in Australia and I have to look it up every time and go oh, okay you know find out what it was um, so yeah that was my third prediction we're gonna we're gonna see uh, a lot of cheap copper come onto the market soon because I think we'll we'll be a bit sort of like um, we we've, we've got overload of craft product. And that word is is now officially banned. No, 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 it's not banned. I'm just getting. I don't, I don't want to get on my rant tonight. Um, so there are my three predictions. Um, that's all from me tonight. I'm going to sit back and enjoy the rest of my little bit of alluring fruits and spices. Fifty one dot one four. It's a sixteen year old single cask. Ah, oh, whiskey sec. You're just coming at the end of the stream. Sorry, but you can rewatch it. This will be up on the Instagram story in just a few minutes. Uh, it takes a moment to upload. And I'll put this one up on YouTube so we can all uh, enjoy it at a later date. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. Uh, I really appreciate you being here, asking amazing questions, um, and and seeing what we're doing as not just the society but in general. Um, uh, and uh, month, uh, multiple monthly matters, but but weekly and still have Bailey rants. Yeah, I, I can live with that. I can live with that. Um, Cooper, sorry, I'm just I'm just on my way out. I'm really sorry. It's it's already at 30 something. So um, like I say, thank you so much everyone for tuning in. I'll see you all tomorrow night, eight o'clock, same time, here uh, for another live stream. And we'll chat about something different tomorrow night. It's always something going on. I like my predictions. Think about your predictions and I'd love to hear them as well tomorrow night. We'll start off where we left off tonight. Cheers.